We're now on to our first discussion, uh, which is the requirement under the proposals that uh, the RIBA Education Review is bringing forward of two years professional practice experience, PPE, within the seven year period envisaged uh, for qualification. And as you heard from Stephen earlier, that's not the only model in the EU, but it is the model um, that uh, the RIBA is proposing. So two years professional practice experience. We've got three speakers who have five minutes each before we get discussion. Uh, first up, please welcome John Asale from Asale Architecture. I'm an architect in practice, and so I'm going to be focusing on that and looking at the way that education can uh, deliver architects that are going to work in my, my firm. The motion today is that this requirement for a minimum of two years professional practical experience uh, within, a, within a seven year period should be endorsed by members of council. So it's in three parts really. The first part is, do we think it's a good idea to have a minimum of two years experience? Well, for me, certainly, more the better. Um, and it's not just the UK that requires this. Uh, most European countries, 19 out of 28, also require a minimum of two years before you become an architect. And in some countries, Austria, Czech Republic and Poland, you need three years. So those of you advocating somehow that the RIBA and the architect profession in this country has a higher gold standard than anywhere else, uh, they're wrong. But there is a significant uh, diversity between uh, countries in the monitoring of this experience. Uh, hardly any uh, countries have the PEDR system, uh, only half, um, and very few do the equivalent of part three. So my own view is that uh, we at ARB and at the RIBA should have a, a new qualification, a practicing certificate qualification, so that if I want to practice in Germany, for instance, I have to go off and study law and study the regulations there. This idea of tr transference of uh, professional skills across Europe I think is flawed in that way. The second requirement, of course, is uh, that there should be professional practical experience. Well, what do we mean by practical experience? Many students just sit in offices facing computers all day. How practical is that? They should get skills in chairing meetings, negotiating with planners, even dealing with their colleagues. What about helping to mix cement limes and mortars on a listed building? The, the definitions of practical experience are very weak. Did you know, for instance, and I know this having looked it up this morning, that to be qualified in this country, you need 24 months of practical experience, of which 12 months should be under the direct supervision of a European architect. But if you can't find one of those, an architect for some other territory counts too, and if you can't get one of those, go and work for a construction professional. And none of it needs to be in the UK. I was always under uh, misapprehension that at least one year uh, needs to be done in the UK, but not the case. In fact, it says uh, in the uh, RIBA rules, it's recommended only that candidates undertake a minimum of 12 months experience within the UK, without which a candidate m may find it difficult to meet the required level of knowledge and skill bit vague for me. Thank goodness we've got PEDRs because most people in this country that have to do part three uh, meet practitioners and academics and their PEDRs are evaluated and so we're able to assess at that final gateway whether they have the appropriate experience to be architects. The third proposition is that this is all to be taken within a seven year period. I'm not sure I agree with that. At the moment uh, many architects, the average is nine and a half years from start to finish. I'm not sure I want to buy into the proposition that all potential architects have got to do all their experience within a seven-year period. A few things for us to consider. What about the impact of all of this on practices? The burden of supporting and mentoring and supervising existing uh, arrangements uh, for professional practical experience falls heavily on our practices. Even with the current scenarios where <coughs> students do a year out after part one and a year out after part two. The proposed integrated system allocates much shorter periods of experience in a sort of sandwich course arrangement. Um, I'm not sure I want to take on lots of students that only work for me for two months at a time. Furthermore, I've not been consulted on it. And what about the poor schools of architecture? 
Most schools of architecture don't have the resources even to deliver their existing obligations. And these obligations, let me read them out to you, because those of you that are practitioners will, will find that the obligations are not complied with. The professional studies advisor works with employers right, and students in a joint effort to ensure the best possible professional development and experience for students. Professional studies advisors are expected to advise employers, never, and students on all aspects of professional experience, including commenting on matters such as salary levels and student capabilities. Well, in the last five or seven years, I've probably uh, trained 70 students. Not one single school of architects has ever been to see me to talk about their students' capabilities or their salaries. So let's consider the, uh, the profession, the structure of the profession to accommodate all of this. There are three and a half thousand practices. There are going to be 14,000 students wanting experience. That's 3.7 students for every practice. And since half the practices have less than uh, five staff, a bit of a challenge. If you only give the, uh, the, the largest uh, practices the ability to be teaching practices, that means that my practice would have 36 students. So I support the proposition of lots of experience, minimum two years. In my practice, you have to do two years post part two in order for us to pay for the part three exam. I'm not sure about the definitions about what this practical experience is, and I'm rather skeptical that it really is practical experience. It's working in an office and doing a logbook. And the seven years, I'm not sure I'd buy into that either. Finally, let me urge the RIBA, SCOSA, Schools of Architecture, and everybody else out there interested in, architecture, uh, in architectural education, to at least speak to the practices. If we're going to be your collaborators and partners in this, we need to be at the table. Thank you. Uh, next up, Neil McLaughlin, Neil McLaughlin Architects. I would say that the practice of architecture must first be understood as an independent discipline with its own ways. It's an error to think of the practice of architecture as something defined by the criteria of the profession or the academy who as institutions will seek to shape the practice of architecture by defining it in relation to their own norms. The quid pro quo between government, profession and academies is historically conditioned. Within this context, I would like to address the frequent question that deals with what are sometimes referred to as oven-ready architects. That is the requirement for schools to concentrate their teaching on the acquisition of certain skills that are deemed necessary by the profession. At any given time, this could be drawing, construction detailing, legal compliance, BIM, or making computer images. Architectural practices call for core employable skills to be prioritised. Schools often insist on their primary vocation as liberal research academies, and the professional institutions seek to balance demands through exhortation, student awards, and prescription. As a result, we're often presented with a polarisation between practice and schools that's focused on a clash between competence and values. Top schools often employ a majority of teachers who deliberately position themselves far from the norms of mainstream practice, and their stu students produce relatively conceptual projects, often gloriously illustrated, that are commonly interpreted as a challenge to the values, ethics, and competence of professional practices. Not unusually this year at the gold medal crit, one of the gold medalists felt unable or unwilling to offer any comment on the project by the winner of the student silver medal. From my experience as a teacher and a practitioner, I cannot deny that a condition of alienation exists between many key schools and many professional practices. There's an entrenched, polarised difference about what constitutes proper standards, values and competence, and who holds the responsibility for preparing candidates for a life of architectural practice. It is a difference that I see often typified by mutual incomprehension. I believe that this difference is based on a misunderstanding about the proper place for education and the proper place for practice. I believe the model that envisages a student spending five or seven years warming up for the practice of architecture during their education and then carrying their acquired skills and values out into practice like a handful of water that spills out through your fingers as it encounters disappointment and harsh reality is an impossible construction. It is doubly flawed in the separation of education and practice. I would insist that practice begins when you enter into architecture at the commencement of training. <laughs> 
These projects in the schools <clears throat> are not merely a dry run. The schools owe it to society to constitute a form of practice that is both engaged with problems and opportunities in the world and also free of the more exacting and de normative demands of professional work. I believe that my teaching colleagues constitute a form of architectural practice through writing and drawing that can stand beside the activity of building in the broad discipline of architecture. These documents, texts, drawings and projects should shape debates for those of us who build. Education should not end with RIBA Part 3 or even limp along through minimum prescribed CPD events. It should no longer be possible for an architect to finish their education. I would propose a more comprehensive model of lifelong learning. If practitioners were coming back to schools throughout their lives, they would be constantly invigorated and by extension constantly invigorating the schools they return to. A discourse in the sense of a ferrying to and fro would be constituted in which practice and education are part of a seamless continuity. The purpose of education, and I'd like to borrow a phrase, is learning how to learn. Once you have done this, you've built an engine for a lifetime of renewal. How is this carried out in my teaching and practice? I go back to teaching as a second education, attempting to connect the forms of practice possible in the schools with the practice of building. I've formed an alumni group from students and ex-colleagues <coughs> who share information and critically review each other's work through shared meetings and digital platforms. They return to teach the current students. This collection of 20 or 30 emerging practices and architects will form a mutual network, constantly re-educating each other throughout their lives. Working in our office involves committing a proportion of your working time to dedicated research and reflection on issues emerging from our building activity. Each person is asked to pursue a subject that can add to the body of knowledge in the practice and beyond. <laughs> These structures of teaching, building and reflecting make a network of lifelong education and practice that is both critical, <coughs> mutual and social and which recirculates between education, construction and inhabitation. Thank you. Uh, and for our first sort of international um, contribution of the day, please welcome from the Royal Institute of Architects in Ireland, Margaret Hines O'Flanagan. Welcome. I'm not sure if coming from Dublin qualifies me as international, but uh, we'll do our best. Um, I'm the admissions director at the RIAI, and I chair the Architects Council of Europe Working Group on the Qualifications Directive. And I also work with the network of competent authorities I'm not an architect, I'm a bureaucrat, and what I want to do is, is place the European and bureaucratic context on this conversation. At the end of the day, regulation is important, but it is far from the be-all and the end-all. And what I've learned working with the Architects' Council of Europe in the last five years in particular, is that the focus on regulation often draws us away from the importance of professionalism and high-quality standards because everybody wants certainty, everybody wants a document that they can rely on and say this is what we have to do and that's not what this conversation is about. So I'd like to just place that in context so, it, so it, it, it's where it belongs, an important side discussion. Article 46 of the Qualifications Directive is very much a mixed blessing. For those familiar with it, it is the it sets out 11 things that an architect must know. Imagine everything you know as an architect distilled into 11 statements. It also states how that should be acquired. And it is correctly referred to as a minimum standard. But it's not just this beautifully crafted and succinct minimum standard. It is the lowest common denominator. And I think that term is far more accurate than minimum standards because the downside of Article 46 is that it has increasingly become seen as the European standard for architecture. I have seen that in formal documents from professional associations and regulators all over Europe. This is the European standard for architecture. It's not. It's the lowest common denominator. And what you are talking about here is something much more advanced than that and much more important. I'll jump slightly ahead to the, the, the notion of gold plating. It can be used in a very positive way. It can also be used as a pejorative term, which is what we've seen happening in Ireland, where regulation was only introduced in 2007 and took effect in 2009. In attempting to apply the professional standard as far as possible, we've been accused of gold plating. 
whereas it is my belief that the PPE, which we will come to, is essential to assure that architects can deliver competent quality services to their clients and to society, possibly more importantly. Um, so that's Article 46 dealt with. It's not the be-all and the end-all, and we should be cautious with it. This is also reflected in the directive in, in the sense that where, Article 40, where you need an Article 46 compliant degree to be recognised in another EU member state, you must also be eligible to register, to be licensed in that state. And that brings me to, to points John already touched on, which is that the vast majority of EU member states go well beyond Article 46 because they're interested in quality services for their society and for consumers in the state. Um, only two states license at the Article 46 level. Everybody else has something higher. The non-regulating states, they're not really non-regulating. They just don't regulate in terms of title. They regulate when it comes to access to work. It's very different. In Denmark, in general, you will need to have permission from the local building control officer, and that will quite often entail not just a degree, but a significant period of practice, which can be three, five, or 10 years, depending on the scale of the project. So the notion and the, the myth that many European countries aren't regulating is untrue, it's just different. And the way the European Commission approaches things, difference is sort of brushed aside because we'd like a very clear model that everyone can understand. Um, in brief, the, the Architects Council of Europe carried out some research last year to benchmark. Um, it's, it's a short study, the RABA contributed to it, as did the ARB. What we wanted to do was check what standards were being applied in Europe to monitor if the PQD was actually going to cause them to be decreased. Because while it raised the minimum, there was always a risk that it really would be seen as the European standard. So we did that benchmark, which is prov proving valuable for other purposes. The vast majority of states do have PPE um, in different guises. In those states, it is generally paid. The majority pay it at a normal rate. I think that's about 60 to 65 percent pay part three graduates, as they'd be called here, at a normal rate. Some pay at a reduced rate because they're studying, but in general, they're paid properly. 90% require specific tasks or experiences. Um, so you must do X, Y, and Z before you can take whatever the assessment is or be deemed to have completed your professional experience properly. 75% have a personal record or logbook, not necessarily in the PEDR style, but there are records kept in, in the majority of cases. Only 60% have formalised assessments. I have to say I would be a fan of formalised assessments. It's all very well to say that people are learning as they work, but it's good to know what they've actually learnt and to have those skills demonstrated. It also allows for a bit more flexibility. One of the things I am concerned about is that only 45% of them have stated standards of what you need to know at the end. So we have these very formulaic models which belong to an older model of education where you have to do X, Y and Z. But in terms of what you're meant to know at the end, it's a bit of a mystery in more than half of the countries. And it would be useful to see that more clearly expressed. Um, where does that bring us then in terms of this discussion? I think it's really important to ensure clear pathways. Um, I think that once you have and I'd agree with, with uh, Neil and, and John in that flexibility is required and we need different, way, different ways of looking at things and the architectural profession is more complex than a five plus two or a seven year model. But once you have established a standard, then you can deal with the exceptions. Then you can deal with how people who can't follow that path can still get to demonstrate that they have the necessary knowledge, skill and competence. But before you can start looking at exceptions, you need your principles set down. And I do think that this proposal goes a very long way in establishing what those principles are, which can be teased out as we go ahead. So at the end, I think the, the two years professional experience is an excellent idea. Certainly, I, we have a, would tend to favour more postgraduate experience and more extended experience. So that maturation that's described in the International Union of Architects discussion of this is, is fully achieved. But overall, at the end of the day, the two years PPE, I think, is, is an undeniable requirement in the formation of architects. <laughs>
Margaret, thank you very much for that. Um, very clearly expressed, and actually that proposition, two years professional practice experience as a minimum um, in a seven-year program will be the first motion to be voted on uh, in about 30 minutes' time by councillors.